Thank you for being with us online. Our desire is to journey with you however you want to connect with us. For more information about our church, visit us at ourjourney.tv. Now, here is Pastor Vince Farrell. This morning I am starting a brand new series that I'm simply calling Traits of an Awesome Church. Traits of an Awesome Church. Now, let me be clear about this title because there's two things I want to bring out about this subject over the next few weeks. First thing is, I believe that it's extremely, everyone say extremely, extremely important that Journey Church be an awesome church. And when I say that, I mean in the sense of that it be worth your time to attend. That when you come on a Sunday morning, that you meet people that are real and genuine. That when you come on a Sunday morning, you experience the presence of God. That when you come on a Sunday morning, that you be awesome for someone else. Now, this is a kickoff series, which means this is an all-skate service, okay? (laughs) I need y'all to interact with this. Amen? Amen. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to make mention to those of you watching online and those of you here that this is a non-spoiler service for in-game, okay? So you don't have to worry about anything going to be said, okay? You just, whoo, everyone relax. (laughs) Now, here's the second thing. When I say church, I mean people. Traits of an awesome people. But not just any people. People who have experienced Jesus Christ in their life. Those individuals are called Christians. So, so this morning, you need to just kind of do a, a flashback to Pee Wee's Playhouse. And every time I say the word church... You in your mind scream real loud, Christian. (laughs) Traits of an awesome church. There we go. So that's what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. And with that being said, let me lay a foundation. God's two greatest commandments are to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, everything that's in you. And then the second one, to love others as yourself. And so we're going to talk about this trait of loving others the way Christ loved you and me. And it's called hospitality. Now, hospitality is is known as as entertaining and and welcoming people, guests or visitors in a church. But, But it's more than that. It's a genuine way to show love for others. Jesus tells us in Matthew 25, 40, that whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. So so when you as a Christian show hospitality, you're doing something that Jesus says is very worthwhile, your time and energy and resources. Now, let me make this statement. When we, the, the church... Some of you catching on. Some of you catching on. When when we as the church, together, we will reach more people for Christ when you have a lifestyle of hospitality. Now think about that for a moment. See, when, when we gather together and we practice a lifestyle of hospitality, we're able to reach people for Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 4, 8 and 9, look at this with me. And above all things, say all things with me. So that means there's some things that he said leading up to this. And above those things that he said, above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another. Oh, <laughs> Don't you wish there was just a period right there? (laughs) Be hospitable with one another. Sure thing. Oh, without grumbling. Oh, man. But what about? 
Now, now listen, I don't need to explain just how much in our culture and our society we've moved away from being hospitable. Um, if, we, if we don't like something, we can tweet about it, boom, and things happen. We, we can post on Facebook, boom, it affects things. It's, it's an instant feedback culture. And, and very rarely, because of that, do we practice, and I'm speaking to myself, the self-restraining factor to be hospitable more than being right. There you go. Yeah. There you go. This is why, if, if you're a person here this morning, that you are a hospitable person, and there's several. I mean, as I look across this audience, and I know those of you watching online, that, that there's individuals that you're just by nature, it comes natural to you. And because of that, you stick out in this culture like a sore thumb. I mean, you're just one of the exceptions because true hospitality requires fervent love. Fervent love. Notice that scripture does not say true hospitality requires really good programs. Notice that it doesn't say true hospitality requires just a certain group of people who know how to pray. It requires fervent love. Now, before I break down and explain this statement, let me... um, Let me just ask us a show of hands. How many of you this morning, you've ever had a bad church experience? All right. The answer is we all have. I think every single one of us on some degree or another, we've had a bad church experience. And the reason why is because the church is made up of people. Now, here's what I've learned in my journey of pastoring. Before I pastored, I I, I spent time traveling to churches, both here stateside as well as um, overseas, teaching and training on biblical principles when it comes to church growth, when it comes to leadership. And here's what I've learned. Every church thinks it's friendly. But, but we all just raised our hands and said we've had bad church experiences. Every church thinks it's welcoming. Every church thinks it's kind. And why do churches think that? Very simple. Because the people that already go to those churches are friendly to the people who are already there. Hey, man. Oh, I'm feeling the anointing right now. It's true. Look at this. Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Oh, man, that's rough. Because let's be honest, we all, can put on a good smiley face on Sunday morning from 10.30 to 11.45. But then when a child in the nursery or kid's church does something that we don't like, we can grumble. The worship team doesn't play the song that we love to sing, we can grumble. Oh, no one here? Okay, y'all leaving me out to dry. Now, let me give you a little bit of backdrop and understanding to this letter. Because if you just read it at face value, you think, okay, yeah, that's kind of difficult. But you just don't know what I've been through this week. And you don't know the type of week I've had with my family. And you don't know what I've been battling. You're right, I don't. But God does. And he gives us this command against a backdrop that it's about 64 years after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And Rome is taken over by a wicked ruler by the name of Nero who burns the city down. No one really knows for sure exactly why, but what we do know is he blamed the Christians. 
And in this culture of Christianity, the Romans already hated Christians because of their relationship with the Jews. And now, even more so, they hate the Christians because of this falsified lie. Can you help them? A little ringing back there, gentlemen. So, it was during this time that Peter wrote this letter, this first epistle, if you would, and his goal was to strengthen Christians, offer hope, teach them how to to live victoriously despite the situation that they were in. And he gives them this counsel of how to treat the Romans who utterly hate you because of lies and deception. So Peter wanted to impress on his fellow believers, and this sounds crazy, okay, that if they remained obedient to this command, that even as the Romans relentlessly persecuted them, that they could actually win Romans over for Jesus. Crazy, huh? That if they would follow this format, that the people that hated them would actually come to Christ because of fervent love. See, fervent love is offering uh, love to put others first and to seek their spiritual good. Now, again, I wish that was the the total definition of fervent love, but it goes on. Because I think all of us would agree that, yeah, that's great. Fervent love is to put others first. Yeah, I kind of have to die to self a little bit, but... But, but, but really, it's for their spiritual good. But it goes on to say, even if they aren't kind or gracious. And that's when we're like, no, you know, it's easy to be hospitable when someone's kind and gracious. But to be hospitable, to have fervent love when someone is not kind and gracious, that's a little bit more difficult, amen? But it gets worse even if they're hostile towards us. It was easier when fervent love was just dying a little bit to self. It's harder when fervent love means completely dying to self. See, this type of love, fervent love, requires you and I as Christians, as the church, to practice agape love. There's four words in the Greek used for love. First one is agape. It's God's love that he has for mankind. It means unconditional. The second type of love is phileo love. It's where we get our English word Philadelphia, the the city of brotherly love. Okay, well, that's what phileo means in Greek. It means brotherly love. Then the third one is eros love. Y'all know what that means, husband and wife, eros. And then the fourth one is what's called storge love. It means admiration, having a, an awe sense, like, like I love Michael Jordan, you know, that type of love. But, but see, agape love, it snuffs out hypocrisy. All those other types of love, they're conditional. As long as Michael Jordan's winning, you know what I mean? As long as my brother and I are getting along, as long as I have no beef with my sister. Those are all conditional. But agape love snuffs out hypocrisy. It's where Romans 12, 9 through 11 says, let love be without hypocrisy. That means we got to go into unconditional love. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. So you can have all these other types of love towards people. Eros. Phileo. Storge. You can have all that type of love. But when it comes to fervent love, you have to have agape love. He goes on to say, in honor giving preference to one another. (laughs) There's that dying to self again. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. And I love how it says in Romans, 
that this hospitality concept that you're talking about, ultimately, it blesses you, sure. Ultimately, it, it helps them. That's great. But ultimately, it's for God. Ultimately. The way you show fervent love to other people ultimately is honoring God. So let's break this down. Hospitality is to be kind and welcoming towards others and strangers. This morning, I want to ask us a a few questions, uh, just a couple questions regarding this. And then the third one I ask us, I want to give us the answer to, okay? Because if we're going to take the scripture verse, clinging to what is good, hating evil, clinging to what is good, and we know having fervent love, agape love for other people in the church... I feel like I need like Pee Wee playing on screen each time I say that, you know. <laughs> you know, something, just something to help you this morning. <laughs> we, were, we were at a bookstore and I found some old DVDs of Pee Wee's Playhouse. I was like, honey, can I buy these, please? She's like, no. no. It made me want to scream real loud. <laughs> so let's, let's, let me give you two questions this morning. Question number one. How do you respond to strangers? Hospitality, the actual word hospitality, is made up of two Greek words that translate uh, philos, loving, Xenos, a stranger. Hospitality is loving a stranger. So that's why I have to ask the question when it comes to hospitality. How do you respond to strangers? Because in an ever-increasing society that's becoming more and more isolated, I mean, studies have shown, uh, sociologists, I love hearing this on the radio, that they've actually studied neighborhoods and they have found out neighborhoods without sidewalks, typically have less connect activity among neighbor, neighbors themselves and higher crime rates. Very interesting. All because of sidewalks. Now, now early days, and those of you that, that remember these days, houses were built with large front porches because that's where people came and fellowshiped and showed hospitality to one another. But as the market started to disintegrate and building costs went up, builders decided, you know what, let's let's shrink the the front and add to the back. And so people weren't hanging out on the front porch as often as they used to. And then with modern technology of the garage door, we can slip in without anyone seeing us. Again, these are not negative, hateful, terrible things. It's just part of our culture. And so in a culture that's ever increasing to do away with eye to eye and more. Yeah, no, uh, it it was great. It was great. We had a great time. You know what I'm saying? So. Sociologists tells us, uh, people who, who study these types of trends, tell us in order for our society not to crumble, we're going to have to get back to learning how to be neighbors. And I would say as a pastor, we've got to learn how to do hospitality. Now, let me, let me teach us some Greek because I love these words. First word is called oikos. Oikos means household. Now, Sociologist tells us that in order to function in a neighborhood society, you need an oikos. You need people that represent your family and your friends, your neighbors. And, and they say, someone that fits in your oikos, you spend at least an hour a week with them. Very interesting. To be considered part of the oikos, the household, you spend at least an hour with them. And then on the flip side of that, you need the xenos. Xenos means stranger. And again, in our culture, in our society, we see strangers every day. But you need that constant balance 
of Oikos and Xenos to have a developed neighborhood experience. Now, in our world, in our culture, when you talk about this, this concept of loving and, and being with people, what happens is you develop some terrible theologies. And our culture, our society has said, you know what, in, in order to have diversity of the neighborhood, of the, of the Oikos relationship, and, and to have unity, then we need to practice as a society tolerance. We need to be tolerant towards people that are different than us, that are strangers, that believe different from us. And, and let me just say, as a spiritual shepherd, that is terrible philosophy. Because I don't know, does anyone in this room, you would say openly, boy, I hope when I go to that place, people just tolerate me. I love going to Journey Church. They tolerate me. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. It's, it, and, and so, Jesus, he actually has a different way of how to have diversity and unity with one another. And he calls it love one another. Love one another. Because in John 13, 35, he says to his disciples, another word for disciples in today's culture would be the word Christian. So he would say to the church, they will know you are my Christ followers by the way you love one another. Isn't it interesting that, that he doesn't say they will know that you are the church Because you've got an awesome sign outside. He doesn't say you're going to know, they're going to know that you are the church. Oh, you're getting a little lazy on me on that. Come on now. Because you have great programs in that building. He says they will know because of your love. Romans goes on to say rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep praying. Well, that's great, okay? So be patient in trouble, keep praying. And when God's people are in need, oh boy, what do we do? Be ready to help them. Always be, and here's a big one, eager to practice hospitality, which leads me to my second question. Where is your eagerness in practicing hospitality? Where are you at on that scale? If we, were to, if we were to scale it 1 to 10, 1 being low and 10 being absolute excited and ecstatic about showing hospitality, where would you be on the scale? I, I, I did not tell Nora what to say, but I'm so grateful that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to us throughout this morning that the truth of the matter is every single one of us should be doing something that we should be eager. And I know, I get it. The pushback on this is, is some of us in this room, we'd say, and maybe those of you online would say, well, you know, I'm just an introvert. And, and I'm, not, I'm not very social. I get that. But listen, I can name you introverts that I have personal relationships with that are serving and doing things far outside their own ability and their own comfort zone because they chose to believe God's word instead of their feelings. That's good stuff right there. Because if you talk to them, their personality hasn't changed. They still prefer to stay at home and close the doors and, and not be around people. But when it comes to the ministry of hospitality, they decided, I'm going to suck it up, buttercup, and here we go. I'm going, to, I'm going to step outside my comfort zone. Because it's not about how I feel. It's not about, well, this is just how I am. It's about how God created you to be. They chose to be who God says they are instead of how they feel. What does God say? Well, here's a couple things. 
Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gave me strength. Romans 2.4, that it's your kindness, O Lord, that leads us to salvation. See, simply being kind opens up, watch this, let me put this, it's so good. Simply being kind opens up a door that literally has the potential to set someone free. It literally has the potential. Simply being kind. I'm just not, I'm just not where I need to be in my spiritual walk. That's okay. Can you be kind? <clears throat> Without grumbling? Well, that's hard for me. Awesome. Because it's hard for everyone. Can I get an amen? amen? It is. It is. If it was easy, he wouldn't have to tell us how to do it. Okay, so here's the third question that I'm going to give us an answer to. How do we increase our hospitality lifestyle? Well, first of all, let me just lay this foundation. We can only overcome evil, because that's what Scripture said. Okay, Hate what is evil. We can only overcome evil if we have fervent love because we've experienced God's forgiveness. Does that make sense? See, it's real easy to, as a worship leader, as a pastor, as someone who is shepherding the flock, it's real easy to notice who in a church has experienced fervent love and forgiveness of God because they're usually the ones most grateful in worshiping. They're usually the ones who engage in worship. It doesn't mean it looks a certain way, but you can just tell they're engaged in worship. They're not bored. They're not just looking at the screen. They're engaged because they have experienced unconditional love in their heart. And because of that, it's just easier for them to express thankfulness. Because one cannot be hospitable if you are harboring unforgiveness. Watch this. And people harboring unforgiveness means they truly don't know the forgiveness God has shown them. And so you, 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 could, you, could, you could try to be hospitable. You could put on a smile face, and, but you will burn out. I, I said this in our Engage class this morning, that burnout in ministry, burnout in church life, isn't because someone's doing everything. It's because they're doing the wrong thing for too long. And so if you're trying to be hospitable in your own desires and, oh, yeah, I heard what Nora said and I heard what Pastor Will said and I hear what, okay, I'm going I'm to serve and, and I'm going to join the nursery department. You're going to get back there and you're going to deplete and burn out very quickly if you haven't already had the love of Jesus in your heart. You're going to need the love of Jesus back there. Because they will push your buttons to walk out of there grumbling. Okay, pop quiz. <clears throat> pop quiz. If I was to ask you, on a scale of 1 to 10, how well does Journey Church do on being kind and friendly and welcoming to first-time guests, what would you rate it as? Now, don't say it out loud, just in your mind. On a scale of 1 to 10, if a visitor comes and sits down, and how, how friendly, how welcome are we to them? Let me give you the answer. Depends on where they sit. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, it, it, it really does. Because we have pockets of people that, man, it just comes naturally for them. And we have pockets of people that it's very hard and difficult. So how do we increase our hospitality lifestyle? Here's the answer. We must do what Jesus did. Before Jesus went to the cross and we showed communion, shared communion this morning, before that moment, Jesus knew what he was about to do to go to the cross. And he enters the room with his disciples, his 12, 
And he knows everything. It said in Scripture that he, all things had been revealed to him. So that means Jesus, who knew everything that was about to happen just before he goes to the cross, he's got one shot, one moment to do something to create an impact to his disciples. What is he going to tell them? What is he going to show them to, that he is about to go to the cross and die for our sins? What is it? He bends down, lowers himself, and he washes their feet. He serves. I had, I had this question come up. Pastor Vince, have you ever thought about doing a, a foot washing service at Journey Church? And I told them, we do that every Sunday. I'm trying to get Pastor John some good still frame shots. And so I went on to explain. I said, first of all, you need to understand something. Number one, I do not want you touching my feet. Okay? I got, I got issues. Don't touch them. Number two, culturally. In culture and biblical days, they wore sandals, walked in dirt, sand. And it was very customary that when you entered into a home that you would remove your sandals and they would have a servant or someone in that household would clean your feet to wipe the dust off. It was customary. It was part of their culture. We have a little bit of that that spills over in today's culture. How many of you have ever entered a friend's house for the first time and you say, hey, do you want me to kick my shoes off right here? You come to my house and, and, and I've had people say, I said, no, leave them on. You're, you're totally fine. But, but we don't do, okay, and I've never had someone enter my house say, hey, I'm taking my shoes off because keep your carpet clean, wash my feet. <laughs> okay? We just don't do that. So, <clears throat> so what we do in, in church world, okay, and I'm going to get off my notes, I'm going to preach to us for a second. What we do in the church world is we see something done in culture in the Bible and we want to make it into a sacrament, and this is what we do. And that, that's not a sacrament. What it is, it's a pattern. So we have a foot washing ministry every Sunday morning. They're called coffee makers. <laughs> now think about this. And I've shared this heartbeat with our, our hospitality team. I've shared with them this exact thing I'm sharing with you. Listen, on a Sunday morning, your responsibility is to help people get some go juice in their life. <laughs> because they're going to come this morning, and, and some of them, they have, they've had to beat their kids to come to church. <laughs> come on, we're going to be late. Come on, hurry. And on the way to the church, oh, don't forget this, or don't forget that. And they're just at it. And they got to walk through our doors going, hi, dear brother, bless you. <laughs> Bless you. All holy be with you. Yes. My children are fantastic. Uh, yeah. Amen. I know. I live here too. And so you know what? Some of them, some of them are like, oh, we didn't grab breakfast. We didn't have time to run out the door. So what we're going to do is we're going to wash their feet. We're going to lower ourselves and we're going to say, you know what? We got donuts for you. We got some coffee for you. We got some juice. Hey, we're, we are glad you're here. Don't stress. Here you go. Enjoy. You need some water? We got water. We're just here to serve you. So, yeah, it doesn't look holy because we don't parade people up on the stage and sit them in chairs and sprinkle water. And I'm not, I'm not being negative about that. I'm just saying we need to understand the purpose of hospitality is not for show. It's because we have fervent love. He serves. So I'm going to ask you to do some things, church family. I'm going to ask you, as a group of Christians, who come here each week, and those of you that are new, I mean, you got to kind of, you got to hear the pastor's pep talk to the family. And you're not excluded. You can jump on board because we believe this process so much, we put it on banners in our building that you can belong here before you believe. And as you feel welcomed and loved, we hope you do believe. 
We hope you make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Because it's only through that that you can then become a fully devoted follower of Christ. Become someone who shows love without the grumbling. So here it is, number one, that I will commit to encourage someone every Sunday. I will commit to encourage someone every Sunday. That means past the three-minute greeting time of shaking hands and how was your week, you dig a little bit deeper. Hey, how are you doing? No, 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 really. How are you doing? We as, as pastors, we love to quote Hebrews 10.25. It talks about you know, being faithful to come to church. But listen, there's a reason why you should not forsake coming together. And it's not just because the pastor can go, oh, we had a lot of people here this morning. The reason why we come together, exhorting one another. That you as a church, you do, you do that. Don't rely on Pastor Will, Pastor Vince, Pastor John, Crystal, Carrie. Don't, don't, don't rely on them, Molly. Don't rely on the staff, Jared. Don't rely on just them to do the work of the ministry. No, 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 that's unbiblical. Biblical is we help you learn ways to do what God's called you to do. Amen. And he says in Ephesians to do the work of the ministry. What's the work of the ministry? Well, here's one of them right here, exhorting one another. And this takes hard work. This does not come naturally. Because, like I said, we live in a me, myself, and I culture. So here's the second thing we got to do. Not only do we commit... That when we come on Sunday, we speak life and encouragement and exhortation. Wow, is that the type of week you've had? Man, you know what, though? You can rise above it. You have Christ in you. That's not going to defeat you. You speak exhortation. Here's the second thing. I will commit to attending a small group. Oh, Pastor Vance, you just Jesus juked me right there. You're just trying to get us in small groups, aren't you? No, listen. We as a church, we do what's called a four-month-on, two-month-off rotation on small groups. February, March, April, and May are four months that we ask you one time a month to subject your life to grow with other Christians. And then we're going to take two months off, June and July, and we come back August, September, October, November. Now, can groups meet on those months? Sure, they can do whatever they want. But my point is, as far as the structure goes, of what we want to help you take those steps, those baby steps on the journey, because in Acts, they continue daily. We're just asking for once a month. Breaking bread house to house. It's important to get in a small group because in a large group like this, you can't get to know everyone in three minutes in your section. So, so I'm asking some of you, for the month of May, for the month of May, go to the red wall. Go right outside this door, hang a right, red wall, small group information. Pick up a small group. Get with that small group leader and say, give me the details. Because for May, and I ain't coming June and July. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Okay, here's the third thing. I will commit to taking what I've learned in here and practicing it out there. Amen. See, the, the ministry of hospitality is not just to help the church. Right. It's for strangers. There you go. The good news is this is the best place to practice. Amen. And you take what you practice outside. So when your waitress comes and you can tell she's having a rough day or something's messed up in the kitchen and I'm sorry it's so late, you get to practice hospitality. Right. When you're out in the job. And, and, and why? Why do we take this outside? Because Hebrews 13.2 says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. I want to end with this personal story that totally transformed my life. I used to manage a restaurant, and we were, <clears throat> we were in a part of town that a lot of interstate came through. 
And one day, a couple people came. I was about 23, 24. No, I'm sorry. I was 27. 27, managing a restaurant. I had some people come through that, man, they looked dirty. Their hair was in dreads, and they just had, they just looked dirty, if you know what I mean. And they walked in, which wasn't uncommon. We get several people off the interstate saying, hey, could I get just a taco or a burrito? Could I, could I get something to eat? And I looked at them and said, sorry, I can't do that. They were very polite when they asked, and they were very polite when I said no. And literally, they, they walked out the door, and I turned around, and I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, you missed it. And I turned back around, and I looked out the two doors we had, and I could not find them anywhere. They were gone. And I missed it. Were they angels? I don't know. I personally think they were. But it changed my heart that day to quit looking at people on the outside. You know what I mean? So we practice hospitality outside these four walls because we as Christians, as the church, aren't supposed to just play games inside these four walls. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. We look forward to doing life with you. Now, let's go this week and be the church in our community as we focus on loving God and loving others. See you next week.